Hi everyone, welcome back to the Vehicle Setup Bootcamp series. This is episode number three. Last time, the concept of the aero map was introduced, and we looked at the way in which a car travels around the outer limits of the aero map through a corner. Today, we'll have a short overview of the different ways this path can be modified based on the initial suspension setup conditions of the car. We'll also look at the effects of independently stiffening the front or the rear springs of the vehicle. Finally, we'll see a series of videos for three different types of cars on three different racetracks to fully grasp the effects of increasing ride heights and decreasing spring stiffnesses. Looking at the theoretical model for vehicle setup procedure that was previously introduced, you can see how ride height tuning is the final crucial step to tuning the aero balance with springs being a supporting element. Spring tuning also bridges the gap between aero balance optimization and mechanical balance adjustment. This was the hypothetical aero map that was used last time around. The red areas depict higher levels of downforce, while the gradual shift to violet indicates the gradual loss in downforce. If you look at this specific map, in order to get the most out of the front wing, we need a very low front ride height and a relatively high rear ride height. The rear wing performance seems to be less biased to the increase of only one specific ride height and tends to work best in a zero rake angle position. The rake angle is the angle made by the floorboard of the car with respect to the ground, with the positive rake angle being the case where the rear ride height is higher than the front. In this particular case, the best trade-off seems to be in a moderately high rear ride height with a relatively high rake angle for the car. Now, let's start moving this path around a little bit. Here we have an open-wheeled vehicle. The distance between the rearmost bottom-facing plane to the surface of the ground is called the rear ride height. Usually for vehicles, this is also calculated at all four ends of the vehicle, namely the front left, front right, rear left, and rear right. Based on the spring stiffness value, the movement of the vehicle either up or down is accordingly restricted. This is depicted by the dark blue dotted lines. This can similarly be shown on the aero map as a length along the x-axis. The same logic can also be applied to the front ride height. The original ride height envelope is shown as a path of black dotted lines on the aero map. Now, let's make a replica of this envelope with a solid black path. Now, let's make a few individual changes to the static setup of the vehicle. What this means is that it's either the stiffness or the ride height values of the vehicle with the driver in the car at rest that are the parameters that we're going to change. Firstly, let's uniformly move the entire vehicle upwards while still keeping the same spring stiffness values. You can see that the entire envelope has shifted linearly in a diagonal direction such that the front and rear ride heights are equally increased. Note that since the suspension travel range has not been altered, since we haven't changed the springs yet, the shape of the envelope still remains constant. One more thing to note here is that realistically, this change isn't as simple as what's been shown here. There are other parameters like bump stop lengths, bump rubber stiffnesses, damper ratings, and suspension kinematics which eventually change camber values that play a crucial role in how the vehicle operates in this range. However, for the sake of simplicity, I've ignored these effects. To understand this, we need a more mathematical approach with the help of specific kinematic data for a car, which is not accessible and is not really required in sim racing, at least not in this case, where we're actually trying to more intuitively set up the vehicle as opposed to a purely calculative approach. As an obverse effect, by uniformly decreasing the ride height of the vehicle, the envelope shifts to the lower left corner of the map with respect to the original reference envelope. Now, Let's decrease the front ride height, but still maintain the rear ride height at its original value. The envelope linearly moves in a negative Y direction on the map, while still maintaining its original shape. When the rake angle is increased, by only changing the rear ride height of the vehicle, the envelope shifts along the positive X direction, as shown here. Now, let's change things up a little. We'll soften the stiffness values for the front and rear springs independently. This means that the range of motion for the front and rear changes accordingly. Remember, changing spring stiffness values changes two things. One is that it affects how much the vehicle can vertically move at all four corners of the car. The second is that it changes the effective stiffness of the specific wheel and subsequently the wheel rate, which takes the effective stiffness of all the suspension linkages and anti-roll elements into account. This basically determines the amount of force required for a unit vertical movement of the vehicle for that specific wheel. So, when the rear spring is softened, the envelope stretches along the x-axis due to the extra wheel travel range for the rear suspension. When the rear is softened, the front movement also gets affected slightly due to kinematics, but once again, for the sake of visualization, we're going to omit this consideration. 
Similarly, when the front springs are adjusted, the range of motion for the front end of the car increases, leading to an elongation of the envelope along the y-axis. Basically, by changing all four parameters individually or together, the ride height envelope can be modified to suit the aerodynamic performance of the car. However, there are some limitations to this process. Mainly, the mechanical balance of the car gets affected when the springs and rake angle are varied because this causes the inertial load distribution on the car to also vary. Here, we have a car in the form of a lumped mass representation. The sprung mass, which includes everything on the car apart from the suspension assembly and the wheels and tires, is represented by this long block. The upright of the car is also connected to the chassis via the suspension system. This can be simplified as a spring and damper system arranged in parallel. The tire is also an elastic element and has its own compression and damping value, which is represented by another spring and damper pair connected between the tire mass and the upright. Now, let's have the setup such that the front end is stiffer than the rear. As the car enters the corner, it hits the curb. A curb is generally a bump placed at the apex of a corner to both define track limits as well as prevent corner cutting. Being at the apex in most corners, the fastest route would be to just clip the end of the curb while cornering. When the car reaches the curb, the front inner wheel assembly moves upwards independent of the chassis and the front spring starts to compress until it reaches the limit of its travel as indicated in this case by the damper bump stops being hit. Beyond this point, the spring can no longer compress at a high rate because the bump stop is present and the car effectively gets pushed upwards. This can eventually cause the car to launch temporarily off the curb resulting in a loss in front end grip and, and ultimately resulting in understeer. Note that this will also compress the rear of the vehicle downwards, thereby compressing the rear springs by a length dependent on their own stiffness values. The effect is opposite in the case of a stiff rear spring. The best way to go about the setup process is to run as stiff a spring combination as possible with the maximum suspension travel limits just under the bump stop limits. Having stiff springs has several advantages as well as a fair share of repercussions. Firstly, such setups have a higher rate of response since the load transfer happens at a higher rate, giving a driver quicker feedback. On the other hand, this also excessively loads the stiffer end of the car, leading to either a front end grip loss, giving understeer, or a rear end loss, giving oversteer. It also has better initial mechanical grip as a direct result of the first point, initial being the operating word here. As the car continues through a corner or hits a curb, if the bump stops are too large or stiff, there can be a loss in mechanical grip. Within the limits of the bump stops, the car can definitely run at peak performance. However, due to lower travel ranges, the stiff springs are absolutely dependent on damper rates and bump stop heights. From an aero perspective, a stiff setup reduces the amount of pitch and to an extent roll as well, thereby keeping the relative angle between the floorboard and the ground to a minimum. This of course can also be a disadvantage at curbs and dips, where the floorboard may either completely move away or entirely scrape on the ground depending on the experience of the driver. Now, to observe the effects of ride height and spring changes on a car, let's have a look at three different types of race cars on three different racing circuits. Firstly, we'll have a look at the Audi R18 LMP1 car around the Sonoma Raceway. This track has drastic elevation changes, and the mechanical grip heavily depends on the springs and ride heights. On the top left, we have the base setup. The top right is a uniform increase of 10mm in ride height. The bottom left is a uniform reduction of spring stiffnesses, and the bottom right is a combination of the spring and ride height changes. So, as we approach corner number two, the bottom two setups are immediately veering off the desired apex as a result of reduced response due to softer springs. Now we go through corner three as we go up the hill. No major difference here as we turn and continue through corner 3A. Slight understeer in the case of the top two rows, potentially due to sudden road elevation changes at the crest. We go downhill into the heavy braking zone into corner four. Gradually turning in, we go to the inner layout of the track. No real difference here in the continual left-hander. Cars are neck and neck. We enter corner six and immediately you see a difference in the response times. The softer springs definitely causing more pitch and slower rate in weight transfer through the corner. Uh, it's good to see the cars completely planted on the ground in this section. Flying down the back straight, we hit the brakes hard for corner 7, which is effectively a double right-hander. Careful to stay off the curbs as it is frankly quite tall here. The track suddenly dips and slides oversteer scene in the top right. Now flying through the final sector, the stiffer springs just edging their way through the limits of the racing line. The softer setups are suffering slight understeer due to reduction in speed response. Now we fly down the final section of the track into the final corner. We slam on the brakes into the 
the final hairpin. All four setups working almost the same here owing to the slow speed of the corner. Now we blast down the start finish straight and we see here that the second setup finishes first closely followed by the stiffer counterpart and then the pace setup coming in in third and the softer spring setup coming in two seconds slower than the fastest. So this shows the effects of having a soft spring on a bumpy track. If you're running soft springs, make sure to increase the ride height in order to prevent the car from bottoming out. With all these bumps, it makes sense to also run, uh, to run higher ride heights and a slightly stiff setup without going too stiff in order to maximize the response of the car. Right, so now let's have a look at a Ferrari 488 GT around the short Watkins Glen track layout. So we're now launching down the main straight, gearing up for the first corner. We're now entering the 90. All four setups nearly matched. We continue going along. We're now going to go through the high speed S's. All four setups once again evenly matched. This is most likely due to the fact that these corners, despite being fast, do not require rapid steering input changes and are quite gradual in their flow. We're now going down the back straight, the car reaching one of its highest speeds at this point of the track, gearing up for the next corner, which is an inner loop chicane, slamming on the brakes, the cars enter the inner loop chicane. We see the base set up ever so slightly ahead of the others. We're now powering on through the long outer loop right-hander. We avoid the boot section of the track and continue straight ahead. The cars reach the extremely high speeds at this point and we gear up to break into the final couple of corners with the stiffer setups having better acceleration down the straight due to a more stable center of gravity. A high speed left-hander shows the stiffer setups taking a much tighter line with the final corner being taken nearly the same in all four cases. We're now exiting the final corner, flying down the main straight to complete a lap. We see that the stiffer setups are finishing slightly ahead of the softer setups. In this case, the setups were a lot more evenly matched. Granted, the track does have a wide range of elevation changes. However, most of these are gradual and do not require a lot of load on the suspension the same way that the corners in the previous track required. Um, the short straights are obviously not a very good benchmark to test the straight line speed difference in these setups. So let's finally have a look at a track that has a few long constant throttle sections. That's right, we're gonna go around the Daytona road layout in a Formula Renault 3.5. We fly through the main tri-oval as we start this flying lap. All four cars heavy on the brakes as we enter the first corner, a long left-hander. The stiffer car slightly ahead as we exit out of the hairpin and into a fast right-left before breaking hard into a right-hand hairpin. The stiffer setups once again have a better yaw control, albeit being a little twitchy at the exit as you can see here. We start flying down the straight, gearing up for corner number four. No visible performance difference in this corner as you can see as we now gear up to slam on the brakes for a long corner number five. All four cars slightly unsteady at the entrance. This corner is always quite slippery in my opinion. Careful at the exit, the softer setups catching up in this technical section. We now take a slow corner number six to wrap up this flowing sequence. And as you can see, all four cars have nearly the same exit speeds and are evenly matched. Now back to the main oval, this is where we start seeing a visible difference. The stiffer setups are already picking up speed, the top right being ahead with more stable pitch rates as compared to the softer setups. We go through the main oval corners number two and three, the right hand side, higher right height setups reaching higher speeds due to less skin drag between the underbody and the inertially stationary ground. You now gear up for the highlight of the track, the bus stop chicane, fast left, right, left sequence, the stiffer setups having an absolutely stunning response with the softer setup slightly understeering upon entry. They however seem to have very steady and planted exits out of the chicane sequence and into the final two corners of this hybrid oval circuit. The top right setup having a distinct advantage on the skin drag is powering on ahead with the base setup closely being followed by the combined bottom right setup and now fly down the main straight to complete a lap around this legendary endurance track the top right finishing first the combined setup second followed by the base and finally the bottom left the reason why the stiff springed high ride height setup finished first was due to the fact that it experienced the least drag all cars are firmly pressed down on the straights due to the large amounts of downforce acting on them. Naturally, the car with the highest ride height and the stiffest spring compresses to have the highest effective ride height. The bottom right setup, despite having a high ride height, also is set up with softer springs, which makes the effective suspension travel more, bringing the car closer to the ground. This can be fixed with the use of more bump stops. With this, we also conclude that the stiff setups work in a very technical section and while the soft setups work better in medium to high speed large radius flowing corners and also in areas of bumps, dips and low traction tarmac. To conclude, let's have a look at this graph which shows the relation between high and low stiffness values for the front and rear springs. 
If you want a highly responsive car, you should consider having a stiff front and rear spring setup. This is suited for setups that have high downforce and for tracks where bottoming out can be an issue. For this setup, it is possible to use relatively low ride heights till a certain limit. If you need more mechanical grip in gradual, long flowing corners, then a soft front and rear spring combination is preferred. It's important to choose higher ride heights in this case, as you might risk bottoming out and hitting the floor on the track surface. If for some reason you have the car tuned to have a higher rear wing angle, which causes understeer, but you need a more neutral steering setup, you can go for a stiffer rear spring. This inertially loads the rear tires, which already have a high cornering stiffness due to the aero being present at that end, thereby balancing it. Stiffening the rear also induces oversteer. The softer the front is, the higher its ride height must be in order to avoid bottoming out. The opposite effect is seen in the case of a relatively stiff front or soft rear. In this case, stiffening the front either causes understeer or balances an oversteering front biased aero setup. The rear ride height must also be run at a higher value in this case. With that, I'd like to conclude this episode. The next time around, we'll look at an extremely important aspect to mechanical balance control, and that is anti-roll bar tuning. We'll also go through the effects of changing the roll bar stiffnesses on the steering performance and handling of a vehicle. Finally, we'll go over the effects of changing wheel alignment parameters such as camber and toe. It looks like the safety car is out. Gotta wait until it goes green again. Until then, take care, thanks for your time, and thanks for watching. I really hope this video series is helping you out and would be very grateful for feedback in order to improve. Thanks a lot. See you next time. This is Saidat signing off.